some 25 years ago, uh, I snuck off campus with some friends of mine uh, during high school to go to lunch. And then afterwards, we found our way into uh, a bookstore where we perused the shelves. And uh, a friend of mine handed me a book uh, by W.S. Merwin and said, read this piece. Uh, it had, he had just read it himself and wanted my take on it. And the piece was Rimbaud's Piano, and uh, I was pretty gobsmacked by it as well. Uh, and the thing that caught my attention wa was the line breaks. Um, Merwin, um, he makes his his breaks don't necessarily don't necessarily end at the end of the sentence. Uh, uh, he might carry a sentence into the second line or the third line. He, he uh, an idea may break between stanzas, so that and, and each idea runs on into the next idea. So finding the breaks it can be a little bit challenging, and and that's also what's engaging because Merwin. Um, challenges the reader to think about the tone and the tempo and the pacing uh, and the meaning of the words. Uh, W.S. Merwin's writing demands to be read aloud, which is really what any poem, poet probably wants. Uh, certainly something I want. And, um, and so the 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 line breaks of W.S. Merwin really stuck with me, and I I bought a couple Merwin books, and I've read them over the years on and off, um, and uh, they've had an influence on me. Um, when I wrote Beyond the Clouds of Misunderstanding a couple decades ago. Um, uh, which is the piece I've probably performed the most, or one of the pieces I've performed the most, uh, his line breaks definitely played a role in the way I designed that piece. Of course, I used a lot more punctuation than him. He doesn't use punctuation at all, and I'm probably an over-punctuator, uh, but something I, <laughs> I work on. Um, but, uh, but, his line breaks have played a role. Uh, they're always sort of in my thinking uh, when I'm deciding what kind of piece I'm writing. And, and that's something I do. I, I kind of write in the style of uh, as often as I write in my own style, whatever that is. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a master of all trades, I guess, or jack of all trades. <laughs> jack of all trades. That's probably more appropriate. Um, for some reason, the other day, I had this urge to read Rimbaud's Piano again. And I was trying to remember which one of his books it was in. I picked up a, a different book, actually, and read a few pieces. And then I remembered which book it was in. And I picked that book up and uh, read the piece. And I read it aloud so I could uh, really... Um, absorb the all the, the nuances and then I felt like reading another one uh, so I read Inheritance um, which is uh, uh, about about well it's a it's about um, how wisdom is passed from generation to generation and that was a interesting idea because and it's an idea that I think about quite a bit so and I've probably written on uh, so uh, that was in my mind and I thought okay I think I'm just gonna ruminate about that and uh, close the book and go about my day but as I was getting ready to walk out the door these lines came to me and I thought I better write these down so I sat down and began to write the lines um, or attempted to write the lines, but they weren't 
the first lines of a poem. I could tell that much. Uh, they seemed like something I had to build towards. I hoped maybe they'd be something that came at the end of a stanza. But uh, as I started writing, um, I didn't know where how I was going to get to them. And about a page and a half in, I finally got the lines, and I thought, oh, good, I've finally done with that. I can go put the title on this piece, and uh, and then then I'll, I'll set it down and go about my day. Um, but uh, I thought, well, let me just read it one more time before I walk out the door. And I read it to myself and aloud, and um, when I got to the end, I realized that was not the end, that there was a different ending and I had to write that. So I wrote that and when I got to the end of that I realized that was also not the ending so I wrote a new ending um, and um, the poem was getting pretty long and um, and I, I still wasn't at the ending and I realized actually that the piece could not have an ending because what I was writing about doesn't have an ending, or not an ending that a person could write, because the ending would be my ending, uh, and I wouldn't be around to write that. Uh, so I had to force an ending, and uh, so I wrote what I thought could lead me to what would serve as an ending, and that's what I did. And then I thought I was done, so I set the piece aside, uh, let the book sit there, actually left it open, the, uh, sitting on the table, on the dining room table, and walked out the door, did whatever things I had to do that day. And I came back, and I didn't feel like typing it up, so I just let it sit. And finally, finally I did type it up, and when I typed it up, I realized typed it up and put it on my blog. Um, and when I put it on the blog, I realized that there were stanza breaks that I had not seen before, that I had to make figure out where the stanza breaks were, and that I had not actually finished it the previous day when I thought I'd finished it. So I continued working on the uh, stanza breaks, and it took me <laughs> a couple more hours to figure out where those were and um, make little tweaks here and there. And when I was finally satisfied with it, I published it. And I thought, well, you know, it is really probably the it is absolutely the most Merwin-esque thing I've ever written. Uh, really screams of his style. And it's probably the most Merwin-esque thing I've ever read, read by anyone who was not W.S. Merwin. Um, so so uh, it really deserves to be read aloud. So um, without further ado, that's what I, I intend to do here. This is Apprentice in Verse. With respect and reverie, sincerity, in vaunted regard, eyes scanning the published pages of cherished editions from the featured bookshelf in my living room, and my voice volunteered in homage to give tempo and resonance to the exercise, reciting out loud the word patterns established through the skillful discipline of their observations, recitations, judgments, and valuations, scribed for posterity and offered up to the foggy and precise alike, kept indefinitely shelved at the Congressional Library, numbered and collecting dust, while in bookstores amusing teenagers with designs on seeming erudite, if only fleetingly, who then 
exit the places where books live and enter the spaces of animals, men, and things known and unknowable, armed only with mimicry and those still sharpening implements of intellect, those originally mentioned emotional assessments, that persistent hunger to explain the world to oneself and record it, share those findings, and emerge, perhaps, a shade wiser for the journey, every bit as much as the destination. But first let us herald those masters who paved the way, traveled ever more haltingly by each erstwhile and eager apprentice in verse, so that standing upon the shoulders of giants we might feel momentarily like giants ourselves, and then if fate might shine her narrow beam, some fortunate few souls, touched by grace, may dare indeed to live the dream, making arrows jealous of Hermes, baton in hand, passing proxy, a sliver of ageless ancient wisdom along the conveyor belt of history, with the ceaseless arrow of infinity, before bowing out to the newly foolish genuflectors at his stupefyingly incongruous altar. Pshaw! As if. Uh, I'm C. Gavin Skeen. Thank you for listening.